Welcome back. So, uh, yes, I activated the recording. So, uh, let's continue with the querying trees. I wanted to add one more thing uh, to the to the indices: is that there's the case where the index fits in memory, but there is also a case where you might even manage for the entire data to fit in memory, right? And this is a, a field, a subfield of databases known as in-memory databases. And some people actually do that. They try to have so many machines that all of the data is in the RAM and then it's even faster than if it's on disk, right? Together with the indices. All right, so, wow, already number 12. Um, so now I'm going to introduce you to query languages for denormalized data. I need to motivate it a little bit because you might ask why we already have APIs for denormalized data. We learned the MongoDB API or we already have Spark SQL or SQL. Why do we need another language? So let me just give you the intuition of why um, we, 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 we have specific languages for denormalized data. So in document stores, we saw in, in all of them, we have some API, but you probably felt that the API sometimes seems arbitrary. Why one? Why minus one? Why an array? Why an object? Why the semantics of end when you have multiple keys and for or you need something else? Why the dollar character and not another character and so on and so on? So there's a lot of arbitrary decisions uh, that basically give you an API that you can use, right? But it's not as intuitive uh, as a query language like SQL. What you will see also when you use an API, it also applies to the RDD API or the Data Frames API of Spark, the Pandas also, is that in the API, you will have a lot of parentheses and curly braces and, uh, and, uh, and uh, square brackets and so on. And in fact, when you do more complex queries like that, you get a full uh, spaghetti of parentheses and curly braces and so on that you don't even know where you close them and when you open them. It's very, very cumbersome. The, the user experience of that is cumbersome. So just because of that, query languages have much less parentheses and, uh, and, uh, and pairs of, of curly braces to, uh, to deal with, right? So this is, uh, this is one of, of course, it's a very superficial motivation, but if you actually have to go through that and write the code, this is a, this is a direct uh, uh, impact on productivity. Um, so now we are doing quite well. I already said for relational tables, we were already quite there, but now even for trees, collections of trees, we did the whole stack and now we are left with query, right? All of that we've done, right? Uh, both for data lakes, by the way, that would be stored on HDFS, and for data stores where you have some proprietary formats, uh, including indices. So now we are left with the query. So what is querying about? Querying is about data independence. It's about the fact that you have some data stored somewhere, you have a data model on the data that tells you exactly the, the features of the data, the shape of the data, the properties of, of the data and so on. The relational model is an example for tables. We saw data models for JSON, data models for XML uh, and so on. And this is fundamental because the data model is what you're manipulating. Once you have a data model, uh, you can have a query language that manipulates that data model. It means that the input and the output of the query language is in terms of data model. And this is the spirit of data independence because when you do that, it's purely mathematical. You're just manipulating instances of the data model and you couldn't care less how it's implemented in C++ or Java. It's, it, you, you don't care about that. The system does it for you. All you need to think about is the data model. So in that case, we are going to be manipulating trees, collections of trees. Uh, but we'll see that there's the same thing for graphs. There are data models and query languages for graphs. They are data models for uh, data cubes and query languages from the, for data cubes. Uh, and the, the query language must be tailored to the data model, right? What works for tables doesn't work for graphs and so on and so on. However, the data independence principle applies to all shapes should apply to all shapes, right? Traditionally, we know it for relational tables like this. So you have logically a SQL query. Physically, it might be PostgreSQL, 
You can also execute SQL on top of Hive, which is a framework, a data warehousing framework on top of Apache SG base that also exists, but it's still SQL. You can also use SQL on top of Spark, that's known as Spark SQL, but again, the language is the same. That is the power of data independence, that you have a language like this that works on plenty of, uh, of physical platforms. It even works on uh, DNA, right? You can even, you even have people that manage to implement uh, 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 SQL and the relational uh, algebra on top of, uh, of uh, DNA uh, chemi chemical reactions. Um, now, we saw that one of the ways to implement that is using uh, uh, an API. But now you see, to put it in perspective, that the API is a means to an end, right? So the end is the query language, but you can implement that query language using an API. So who is going to use the API in the end? It's going to be the engineers that design the system. But ideally, the end user shouldn't have to deal with the API. They just have a query language, right? And in fact, the direction in which it's moving is that even the query language might not be directly exposed to the end user. You might even have a large language model that builds the queries and interacts with it, which might be the future direction that this is taking. But we still need all elements in the stack. This is why we learned about APIs, because they are useful. And maybe some of you will have to use APIs like that to implement a higher level uh, query language or functionality on top, right? But these are all levels in a, in a multi-layer technological stack. Um, right, so now this is the RDD API. So you see that one is actually quite cumbersome because it doesn't know about JSON. So you need to use a specific part JSON function. And then you use Python dictionaries and so on and so on. A bit better could be with data frames, but you see that doesn't change, right? You could use data frames for data that is homogeneous and normalized. But the problem is you're hitting the limits because in the realm of big data, the data might not be homogeneous and, uh, and flat, right? So uh, in reality, if you accumulate data over multiple years or multiple decades, you'll find the data to be nested and to be heterogeneous. And it means that all the kind of things that you see on the screen are going to happen. You're going to have extra values that some objects will have extra values, maybe because one year you modify the logging mechanism and you add more properties, but you're not adding them to the past, right? It's only the future values. So now you end up with extra values. Sometimes you might have missing values, right? Uh, again, because of a change of schema in, in the data you accumulate. Some values might be invalid. Maybe here you have um, quoted integers, which are technically strings, and then you move on to integers, right? So then you breach domain integrity. And finally, uh, you also break the first normal form, uh, if you have nested table in there, nested tables, right, nested values. It doesn't have to be all of that. These are all the things you can break, but you might break this and this and not that, right? So there's many ways you can, you, can, uh, you can do it. So nested and heterogeneous is the most general, but you can also have nested, but still homogeneous, or you can have heterogeneous, but not nested, right? So flat and heterogeneous. So th these are all cases. Data frames are the case where it's homogeneous and nested, right? Now, um, we saw that when we introduce this denormalization and the data can be nested and heterogeneous, it basically comes down to collections of trees. For whom is that now intuitive that we do, when you denormalize data in that way, you get trees? Perfect, awesome, so you got the intuition. So this is why, this is the whole reason why now we are working with collections of trees, which are more generic than tables. Um, so one might think, okay, wh why don't we use SQL to work on collections of trees, right? We can just add a few dots to the SQL language, uh, have an explode function and so on, as I showed you last time. Um, but there are several problems with that. The first problem is that if your data is heterogeneous, and you take a hammer and force fit it into a data frame, you can do it with Spark, uh, then it's going to end up just making the column a string and it just force feeds a serialization of the data as a string. So here, it's not an object, it's really a string that contains the serialized value of the object, but this is really a string. And why does it do it? Because it notices that here, this is not an object, it, it has incompatible types, so it just falls back to just a string. 
And basically what happens is that you're making it uh, the, the problem of whoever has to then continue with that, right? So now whoever has to query this data is going to have trouble because now they have to distinguish between this and this. But since everything is a string, it's going to be very cumbersome to you, right? The same goes here. It's a string because we have a string here and an array here. So it makes everything a string. And again, this is not an array. This is a string that contains the serialized array. Right, so this is all a string, and now because of just one extra field there, it forces you to add a column with nulls everywhere, right? And maybe you don't, you just don't see it uh, in the lecture hall because it's uh, behind the toolbar, but just because there was a, a value that is an integer in there. So these are already the limits that you might manage to do that, but you're making, you're creating a nightmare for whoever is now going to query that data frame, right? Uh, so that's the first problem, uh, and good luck doing that with SQL uh, to disentangle these uh, these uh, strings uh, and, and special casing, the cases where it's a serialized array, a serialized object, uh, and so on. Um, but even assuming you have something homogeneous, which you might have, is there a question? Yeah, no, no. Uh, yeah go ahead. Uh, can you go to the previous slide a bit? <clears throat> On the very, no, no, uh, to just where we were with, uh, the, the yeah there okay on the very last row with uh, pythagoras why do we have uh, a number uh, null as the over there even though the uh, field exists uh, let me try to remove can i remove this i once found a way to make the toolbar disappear but let me oh yeah now it disappears oh, yes. oh, so sorry, now you sorry, can sorry, tell sorry. me yeah yeah sorry. so now you have the nine that appears and just because of it we had the nulls everywhere so, okay yeah, yeah. thank mm -hmm. you yeah, awesome. It's much better without the without the the the, the bar. Okay. Uh, okay. So now, okay, let's be optimistic and assume that the data is homogeneous. So that doesn't happen. Then maybe we still have hope that SQL helps us. Um, and indeed, uh, Spark SQL was extended with dots in order to navigate objects and with the explode function in order to navigate arrays. So it's it's kind of working, right? Um, I don't know for you, but for me, this is not intuitive. When I look at these queries, I really have to think a lot about figuring out what they are doing. And now imagine queries like this, but with like 20 or 30 lines and, you know, wrap, wrapping your head around what it's doing. It's very, very tough. And the reason why it's tough is that SQL wasn't designed for trees. It was designed for tables that are flat. So this is just an ad hoc extension of SQL that tries to make it work for trees but that doesn't quite work. It's as if you would like, you have a washing machine and you would like to wash your dishes with that and you try to kind of tweak the washing machine to work with dishes, right? It's a little bit something similar. Uh, but if you want to wash your dishes, you need a, a, a dishwasher, right? It works much better. It's a little bit the same idea. Uh, all right. And so, so this is one aspect, but another aspect is also that sometimes you can come up with a very easy uh, uh, use case in English, a sentence, a one sentence description of what you want and try to do it with SQL. And there is a specific uh, uh, use case here that is real life. It's contributed by Ingo Muller. He was a head TA for this course. Uh, so for a paper, he came up with this. This query is very long. What it does is actually very simple except that I'm not able to understand the query. So I actually have to, to cheat and look at this one to understand what it's doing. So it's basically going to go through a GitHub, uh, Git GitHub uh, events, so commits and so on. And it's looking for every event for the top committer and it's returning the commits uh, uh, that, that were committed by a top committer, right? So it's something you can describe in English relatively easily. But if you try to do it with SQL, this is what you end up with. You have this absolutely huge query. Uh, and the problem is that these queries go back and forth in the nesting level. This is why it's so complex. But now you see, this is a motivation for you know, having a better language than, than SQL. For trees, I'm not saying SQL is not good. SQL is perfect for tables. If you have relational tables, you should be using SQL. I'm only talking about denormalized data here. So in the case of denormalized data, other languages like JSONIC that we are going to learn does the same thing, but look, this is the number of lines in SQL. This is how you do it in JSONIC. It's much simpler to 
to understand. So this is one of the of the motivating examples. Um, in fact, the data set that we use here is uh, has very often been used in exams. It might actually be used again for this exam. I don't know if that's the plan of the TA team, but we kind of like this data set. Uh, it's basically exported from GitHub. Uh, and uh, it contains all of the what happens there, pushes, uh, commits, and so on and so on. Uh, the reason we like it is that it's heterogeneous because that data set was accumulated over a very, very long, long time. And it means that we have sometimes different types at the same location in the objects. The number of attributes, see in every object, you're going to have roughly 100 attributes, still below the 16 megabytes. And then the total number of attributes, if you look at it, the entire collection is actually 1,300. So every object contains 100 of them chosen among 1,300. That's already breaking in a lot of relational databases. Relational databases can handle maybe 255 attributes, but surely not 1,300. Now, there exists more modern relational databases that can handle that many attributes, but it took some efforts to actually go there, right? So this is considered a very large number of attributes, and it's going to be sparse because, again, the objects don't have every time the 1,300 attributes. They only have some of them in there. So that is already very heterogeneous. And 10% of the path, so what we call a path, is the location of the object, right? This is a path, this is a path, this is a path. 10% of the paths have mixed types, meaning that the same location is going to be an integer in that object, but in, th in that other object, at exactly the same place, you're going to have an array of integers. And that happens for 10% of the paths. This is a lot, right? So this is very heterogeneous. So we love that, uh, uh, that uh, data set because you just cannot make it work with, uh, with SQL in general, right? Or you can hope and pray that your query doesn't touch the heterogeneous part, but, uh, but it just, uh, it just uh, doesn't work. Basically, if you want to do it with SQL, you would have to add more code written in Python or Java to handle uh, decoding the uh, heterogeneity in there. That's better done with Java or Python. So it breaks the purpose of having a language like SQL. All right, so this is why we have this, um, this data set. It has 2.9 billion events in total, 7.6 terabytes is the one that we, we like to use. In fact, it's much more than that because you have that for every hour of every day over multiple years. Of course, for the exam, we are not throwing 7.6 terabytes at you. We use a small subset that is, I think, uh, 80 megabytes or something. You know, it's reasonably small, uh, but that's the spirit. And in fact, um, in our experiments where we tried to we tried to benchmark that uh, in one of our papers, so we tried to execute queries with various languages, we noticed, I can't remember if it was with this data set or another one, that it happens that you have objects that are more than 16 megabytes because this is just a text file. It's a huge text file with the JSON. And sometimes you do happen to have a line that is more than 16 megabytes for a single object. And when you try to fit that into MongoDB or into uh, you know, a, a document store, many of them will just give you an error. I cannot handle it. There's one object, there's a billion objects, and maybe 10 of them are more than 16 megabytes error. Or maybe in the best case, it just ignores the import. But then you're missing these objects. So you see, these are some of the, uh, some of the limitations of uh, some systems. OK, which brings us to uh, JSONIC. Which is, uh, which is the language we are going to learn that is kind of like SQL, except that it handles nested heterogeneous data. It works on Spark. Uh, it could work also on HBase, on Hadoop, so on, on many systems, because it's a, it's a generic language. Um, and the way it works on Spark is uh, based on an engine developed here at ETH called uh, RumbleDB. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, uh, do I have a page? Here? Yeah, I do, because RumbleDB actually was, uh, was years of work by many, many, many students of uh, computer science, data students, uh, data science. Uh, we also had, I think, electrical engineers. Uh, so so it's, uh, it's really uh, a lot of work was put in there. It's relatively stable. You can use it. I use it for my own data. Uh, and so we use it in the exercises. This is what you had in the, in the tutorial, actually, for the JSONIC, the three tutorials. 
we also have it on exam day it's running and so we keep releasing new versions and we try to fix bugs but uh, again it's relatively stable now okay so uh yeah that's the that's the engine um and uh i'm going to now teach you a bit of jsonic what makes my life a little bit easier is that uh based on the demand from uh, previous semesters instead of throwing everything at you in just one week i spread it a little bit over the semester i gave you three tutorials who looked at them ah plenty of you awesome if you haven't then please do um, so this uh, means that you already know a few things about JSONIC. You know arithmetics, you know logic, you know how to bind variables with let. Uh, and this week also I pushed yesterday uh, a way to, uh, to uh, navigate through data sets. If you haven't, don't worry because I'm going to rehearse all of that even today. Uh, so if you haven't seen it, that's fine. You can follow. But if you read the tutorials, you will just find it easier right to to navigate this because there's a lot of things that now you will already know but i will push you even further of course than these uh, than these tutorials so the first thing is that jsonic just like sql is a declarative and functional language it's about the what and not the how in jsonic you don't care how things are executed you just say what you want what you want to do um so that's declarative and functional means that Every expression in the language takes an instance of the data model and returns an instance of the data model. Now, in the case of SQL, an instance of the data model means a relational table, right? So every, every select from where query in SQL takes a table, returns a table. But now we cannot just have tables, right? We need something more generic than tables that covers has nested and heterogeneous data, right? And this will be known as sequences of items. You will probably hear me say sequences of high items 200 times today. So I think at the end of the day, you, you just remember that this is what JSONIC manipulates, sequences of items. And sequences of items are just a generalization of relational tables. But more generally, it's instances of the models. Uh, that would be graphs or cubes, if you have languages that support graphs or cubes, right? Um, and there's a third adjective that we used for that language that is set-based. Set-based means that you just don't, mani you don't manipulate one value at a time. If you're used to Java or Python, every time you call a method, you pass one value, right? It's a pointer to something. It might be a complex value. You might have a pointer to a list or a pointer to a dictionary, but you still pass a pointer to that, right? So it's a single value. All of these languages are using single values for the parameters and returns of the function. But in query languages, it's called set-based because we can have billions or trillions of, uh, of, uh, of values in there. And so in the case of uh, SQL, it's going to be billions of records, right, that we manipulate. In the case of JSONIC, it can be a sequence of billions of items. But the principle is the same. We love to handle billions and trillions of objects at the same time. This is what we love to do in databases. That's one of the key differences with Java or Python. Uh, of course, you can have also in Python an array that contains records, but I doubt that you can fit trillions of them in a single array. But in SQL or JSONIC, you can, because you can put that on top of a cluster. Uh, and actually, uh, the break is approaching, I'm just uh, surveying the time. It really feels like a Lego game this whole thing. I'm just going to give you, just like we did with JSON and XML, I gave you building blocks, then you assemble them. JSON is the same. I'm just going to give you the building blocks. I think there's 37 building blocks or something. You don't need to know all of them, but then you just assemble them to get a big query. So that leaves us here. I will see you in 50 minutes, 15 minutes after the break, and I'll show you how we play that big Lego game. Thank you.